Hi everyone, I'm Linda Sheldonfeld with the International Grief Institute and this is Moments of Hope, a show featuring people who have turned pain into purpose and are doing good things in the world. And tonight's guest is Gary Rowe. But before we get to Gary, hang tight Gary, I just want to share with people a quick reminder that the 12 Nights of Kindness um, starts in three days. And if you aren't familiar with the 12 Nights of Kindness, it is my own family tradition based upon the 12 days of Christmas that spread joy to people in need. And it's a really great way to teach children to be givers of joy. And it also is a wonderful way to help lift our own holiday spirits because the holidays can be challenging, especially for those of us who have lost someone we love. And there's no better way to lift our own spirits than to give to someone else in need. And so how it works is you take a poem and a little gift based upon the 12 days of Christmas and you leave it on the porch of a neighbor who could use a little lift in their holiday cheer. And the full instructions are on my website, lindafell.com at the top left-hand corner. It's super easy, it's inexpensive, and we share my own 12 Nights of Kindness every um, night on Facebook. You can watch us live as we do it. And you can also start your own tradition with your children or do it yourself. And again, the instructions with the full printables are on my website, but I wanna share with you what the little gifts look like. So this is a um, gift for night number one, and it has a little poem that explains it, and you leave it on the porch of your uh, neighbor in need. And so the first night, of course, is a partridge in a pear tree. And so this is just a cute little partridge, uh, I think it's a partridge <laughs> ornament. And we usually put a handful of holiday candy to go in the bag. And this year's recipient is a family who just lost their dad. He died in their driveway two months ago. And the 11 year old grandson found him and tried to save him. And so the whole family is very traumatized. And so I picked them in our neighborhood because, you know, beginning the holiday season without your loved one, they're missing their dad, their granddad, and our neighbor Kim, her husband. And he was a really lovely man. His name was Bob. And all who knew him loved him. He just really was a lovely, lovely soul. And so I picked that family. And you can watch us every night, starting Thursday night, right on my own Facebook page, Linda Sheldon Fell, my personal Facebook page. And I'm super excited to begin spreading joy to that family through 12 Nights of Kindness. Um, now, Gary, I. I want to introduce you, but I also want to pair this in with our neighbor's tragedy. Mm. You also lost your dad. And so I want to talk about that, but, but really quick, I want to let people know who you are. You are an author, you are a speaker, you're a hospice chaplain, bless your heart, and you are a grief specialist with eight books and over 500 articles um, in print. And you also wrote the book called Surviving the Holidays Without You. You have endured childhood sexual abuse, your parents divorced, your father died in front of you, and your mom tried to die by suicide. So you know grief and you have weathered a number of Christmases ever since then. And I look forward to hearing your tips from your book about how to survive the holidays without someone you love. But going back to when you first lost your dad, how old were you? I was, I was. I'm sorry, I, I, I you froze up on me a little bit. <laughs> Gotta love technology. How old were you? Okay. And so do I you- I was 15. What's that? I'm having, I think we're freezing up a little bit. So viewers, bear with us. It, okay, there you are. Sometimes you're freezing and we just keep going. So so say that again. You were five? I was 15 when I lost my dad. 15. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And so it's, it must be vivid in your mind about it, what happened. It really is. It was a situation where my, my mom 
And uh, after the divorce, I lived with my dad. He was very, very stable and he was very much my world. He was my one functional parent. And then one Sunday afternoon, and uh, by the time I got there, um, he wasn't breathing. Um, I, I was actually a lifeguard and certified in CPR, et cetera, but it never ever even occurred to me to perform CPR on my dad. I, I couldn't even remember 911. It took a while for me to remember that. So, images, you know, unseen or unhear. So, and those images, I can close. Am okay, I freezing every, every so often you're cutting out on me, so I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if viewers are, um, but if I have a blank stare on, on my face, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> then, then, then I know that you're free of frozen too. <laughs> yeah, so can you hear me okay? Am I freezing up on you? You are sometimes, but right now I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Okay, well, we'll just keep keep going here. So with your dad, well, first off, you know, I'm very, very sorry how, how terrible for you, especially as a young, impressionable teenager. And I think about when we lost our daughter, Allie, she was 15 and our youngest was 13. And I think back on how something like that really skews your entire teenage years. And so what was your first Christmas like after losing your dad? Do you remember? Oh, yes. I, I remember that one very, very well. Um, soon after my dad died, um, uh, my mom was, was in a psychiatric hospital for a while, and she got out. And, and then, as you said, there was, there was a, she attempted to take her own life. And I wound up being taken in by a family that I knew very, very well. Uh, they had four children. I became the oldest by three months. And we actually went from Texas to Colorado for that, for my first Christmas with them. It was, I felt very safe. I felt very loved. But there were three other families there as well. And on Christmas Eve, we all got together and they started sharing Christmas stories. And I felt so alone. Oh my goodness. Um, in fact, I felt so alone at one point that I just excused myself to the restroom and Oh my goodness. Because you you did not have any good Christmas stories to share. Is that what was going through your mind? Um, abuse thing in my childhood. Me against, uh, I think, I think intellectual. And I'm betting I'm on you because you're <laughs> so Gary it, it, you're cutting out on me and I'm missing a fair bit of your story and it, 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 the viewers are saying you're cutting out on them as okay. well so let's try this um, let's keep going if it does it again I'm going to have you refresh your browser do you have anything else open up on your your computer I do not Okay, so if it, if it does it again, let's go ahead and refresh your browser and see if we get a clean connection. Um, okay. So going back to your, your first Christmas, um, first off, was that your first Christmas where you actually felt safe? In many ways, I would say yes. Okay. Yes, it was. Safe, but sad. <laughs> yeah. 
And so I think about how, uh, you know, people who have had those traumatic experiences called mm. adverse childhood experiences, ACE, ACE uh, their brain is dealing with trauma and certain things happen to the traumatic brain. And so I wanna go back to when you first found your father and you couldn't even remember 911. It's because your brain was flooded with the hormones that uh, cause the fight or flight that we all know when we have a lot of fear. And it also causes amnesia in other parts of our brain. And that's mm -hmm. why it's very hard to think at the moment for you know things that you would know just like that. Uh, in the moment of trauma, your brain is overwhelmed with all that adrenaline and such. And so um, I, I hope that you haven't beaten yourself up all these years thinking that you might have been able to save your father had you remembered uh, you know, to call 911 sooner or what have you. I just want you to know that. But going back to the Christmas aspect, I think that, you know, how traumatic that would be for you to suddenly have a Christmas where you feel safe. Mm. And what that must have been like feeling, was it a bit like fish out of water? It, it or was. was it such a, a longing of, oh my gosh, I finally feel loved? It, it really was. It was, it was surreal. On, on the one hand, I so wanted to be a part of things and really, and I was a part of things. And there wasn't anything that anyone did in that room that isolated me. They did everything they could to include me. Um, Bless their hearts. Yes, they did. And and it was just my own heart. Um, it w I was missing my dad. It had only been a couple of months. And um, uh, plus I was in a, a new life where I was really trying to find my footing. As yeah. you know, as often the case when we have a major loss in our life, it's it's a new world now because mm -hmm. someone we love is missing and it really, it shakes our whole life web as, as such. And things are, things are just weird and they're surreal. Yeah. You know, well said, did you feel like because you were seeing that this is what Christmas was supposed to be like, this is what we see on the Hallmark movies, on the advertisements, you know, on TV, uh, did you feel like, oh my goodness, you know, this is what it's been all about. And also, did you feel angry that you had missed out all those years mm. on Christmas is portrayed to us through the media. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are, um, you know, our expectations of the holidays are just astounding. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yes, and when I experienced holidays in a safe environment, and I realized at the same time I was grieving my dad, but as you said, I think I was grieving, gosh, I, I missed this for 15 years. You know, this sense of family, this sense of safety, because one of the things that happened in my family, uh, partially because of my mom's mental illness, was there was a slow um, disconnect from the, rest, from the rest of the family, which the rest of the family was very, very tight. And then we were out there in the stratosphere somewhere. Okay. Um, so they, they could have been your support and help you overcome, but instead the mental illness caused your little core circle to move further away from what would have been your support circle. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. What is Christmas like for you now? You know, um, what fascinating, you ask such good questions. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, it, it is it is full of joy as long as I let it be what Christmas is really about, um, which it is really not about me and it is not about what happened to me. It's about something much bigger that it's a part of a much bigger picture that we are all a part of as well and fulfill key roles in. Um, it's it's really fast. I have seven adopted kids. And so. 
I'm, you know, I'm with most of those kids. If, if they're able to get here, I'm able to get there uh, during the holidays at some point. And that's just, that's just a real joy. Um, at the same time, I noticed that I really have to manage my expectations because mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it's being an abuse victim as a child where you want to see things better than they are or you see things worse than they are. And so you never really see things accurately. And so there is this expectation that these holidays should be a fa la 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 event and uh, I should be jolly even though I know from what God has called me to do as a living, you know, as a grief specialist and hospice chaplain, I start hearing about holiday grief in late September. And mm -hmm. um, I know it's a very, very tough time of year. And that actually helps me manage my own expectations. So I would say my holidays are more realistic now. I would say that I expect much less from the holidays in terms of it is the holidays job or somebody else's job to make me feel jolly and happy and that I'm supposed to be having a good time here. You know, that is such wise insight. Incredible. And I really appreciate you bringing that up because, you know, many of us, well, I grew up opposite of you. I, I'm one of five kids. Christmas was everything that we see on TV. It was just a magical time. Mm. And since losing our daughter nine years ago, there is nothing that robs us of Christmas spirit quicker than losing a loved one. And suddenly, you know, not only are we grieving their empty chair at the table and all that they brought to our world, we're grieving the future without them. Every yes. Christmas from that point forward, every Hanukkah, yes. every Thanksgiving, yes. will not have them as part of our memory banks, that mm -hmm. you know, our memories that haven't yet been stored in our memory bank. And mm -hmm. so there's so much more to grieve. And, you know, I think what you said about it, it's up to you. Someone else can't put the jolly in your your Christmas. It we really have to advocate for ourselves and and you know be proactive. Mm. And that is why I do the 12 nights of kindness. I and for those some of you already know my story, but I just want to touch on it really quick why the 12 nights of kindness is so important to me because it was something I started with my kids years ago. And then when we lost Allie I didn't want to celebrate Christmas. I just, I actually wanted to skip, hit the pause button mm -hmm. and forget the holidays. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And of course I, I went through the motions because we had other children. We had a grandson, a young grandson, and I didn't want to rob them. Right. right. And so but I didn't have the emotional bandwidth to do mm -hmm. the 12 nights of kindness. It was just more that I could do. And a couple of years ago, our seventh year without Allie, I, our grandson was nine and I thought, you know, he's a perfect age to learn the joys of giving. And mm. I could really use a dose of cheer myself. And there's for me personally, there's nothing better than to help someone else to lift my own heart. And so uh, we started the tradition up again and I taught him and it was so much fun and it lifted my spirits. It gives me something to look forward to. And last year, the family that we chose was someone who was at the end stage of cancer. She had weeks left to live. Mm. And I wanted my grandson to understand the importance of compassion. And, you know, he doesn't really remember Allie. And he certainly at age two, when he lost his aunt, he doesn't remember the, the you know, how grandma and granddad and his aunts and uncles and his own mom was and all that. He was just too young. Um, and so we've done a good job of making sure that our own sadness did not rob him of the holiday spirit, et cetera, et cetera. And so long story short, I wanted him to understand that not everyone um, has, you know, this this Hallmark picture perfect Christmas. And this family, you know, the, the, the mom was dying of cancer. And so wouldn't it be wonderful to teach him about the joys of giving by, you know, doing her. And so we did. Long story short, she passed four weeks later 
and it mm. really gave me something to it was it was a balm for my own heart of knowing that this family was going to face the rest of their life without their loved one. This was their very final holiday season. And our grandson and I were doing something to make their holidays a little bit brighter. Mm -hmm. And she who heals others heals herself. And so when you touched on it's, you know, your responsibility to put the jolly back in your, in your holiday um, jingle, I think that is so true for all of us. Um, so how do we do that? For me, it's the 12 nights of kindness. And I have some other things that I do as well, which I can share. But, you know, for you, you wrote a book about it. So mm -hmm. what prompted you to write that book? You know, I think it was uh, really the hospice chaplain experience of mm -hmm. hearing about the intensity of holiday grief. And of course, it tapped right into my own story and I realized, oh yes, I I remember what that was like. And there's still trailers of that, you know, yeah. even even today. And if there weren't trailers of that grief in my life, well, what would that say about my dad and my relationship with him or the other people that have um, gone on before me in the in the years since? So that and I think I couldn't find anything out there that was of any length that kind of walked through the entire holiday experience and explained, you know, why is this so hard? Um, I mean, there are reasons why it's hard other than simply I've had a loved one die. Um, you know, one of the big things is, as you said, holidays are chalked with memories. You know, we are we are hyper aware of who's missing. We bump into a memory with every single step. The holidays have this unique ability to surface our losses and, you know, stick them right in front of our faces. And, and so loss. they yeah. really do. And so then we have, it seems like we're faced with options of what are my options here? Um, I could hunker down and go into for fortress mode and pull the blanket over my head and wait. I could hope and pray that the Grinch really sto shows up and steals Christmas somehow. <laughs> um, or I can find, I've got, I've got to find a way to somehow be able to take my grief seriously because it's real mm -hmm. and to somehow love myself in that and love the people around me and to somehow take some kind of action to where I don't feel like just the holidays are wiping the floor with me, you know, that, that, that I can use the holidays somehow instead of just letting the holidays use me. And so that is what kind of came out of that. The, the other thing is it, at Hospice Brazos Valley where I work, we do a, a holiday grief program called Surviving the, the Holidays and Holidays Without You. So I put those two together and uh, this is kind of a compilation of all of that. And, okay. you know, one of the big things for me, Linda, is that it's really okay to hurt. It really is okay to grieve during the holidays. Uh, the world tells us it's not. Uh, some people who are close to us tell us maybe it's not. Uh, the people at Walmart or in the grocery store tell us it's not uh, with their faces or with their actions. But the fact of the matter is it really is okay to grieve and to be real with your own heart at the holidays. Now, how and what venues and who in front of, that's another, that's part of the battle of this whole thing. And that's unique to each person. It is. And so, you know, d depending upon our relationships and such and the settings. And, you know, I think it is really important. And I'm really glad that you brought it up, how we have to honor our grief and how it is magnified. Because traditions from years past are no longer. Uh, there's a lot that we grieve. It's very complex. Very. And many of us do it invisible. Mm. And so what I have come to find is that many pr people hurt over the holidays. And one of my own tips, if you, if you don't have the emotional bandwidth to do the 12 nights of kindness, you can still do something 
for someone else uh, that, you know, goes out into like a, a soup mm -hmm. kitchen, okay? Mm -hmm. Or spending time at the, the women care shelter. And what that does for us is it reminds us that we're not the only one who's struggling, that many people struggle and it comes in many forms. It's not always loss of a loved one. It can be loss of a home, loss of a relationship. Yes. Um, you know, the, the women and children in a women care shelter have loss of, you know, safety and security and they've witnessed domestic violence and this, that and the other. And, mm. and so many, many people are struggling through the holidays and we tend to do it invisibly because mm. we don't want to rob others of joy, but it is important to honor our own pain our own wound. You, you, it, it's okay. Own it. It's part of your story. Yes. And when you own it and share it in the safe settings, of course, yes. but you give someone else permission to own their own story. And that's empowering. That's very empowering. That and it's also very healing because the first step toward healing is validating your loss. Mm hmm so, so I'm, yes. I'm glad that you brought that up. So what is another tip that from your book? Um, another tip is just recognizing um, that whatever loss you think you're grieving, as you just said, it's more than that. Um, mm -hmm. Because we, because we all have a history of loss and it dates back almost to the time that we were born. And if we take a minute to just, not a minute, it's going to take more than a minute, to actually catalog <laughs> our history of loss, and we realize that these losses all come together, they're all cumulative, and so when we're grieving what we consider to be the current loss, we are at the same time grieving all of the others as well. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there are many people that say, wow, you know, I lost... Uh, let's say, for example, I lost my mom three years ago and, you know, I didn't feel like I grieved that hard, but now I feel terrible because I lost my dad and I'm falling apart. And they think it's about they love their dad, but not their mom. But it's not that at all. It's that, you know, these things are all cumulative and mm -hmm. sooner or later, our hearts just can't hold it in anymore. And it begins to either burst forth like a volcano or leak like a sieve or uh, just kind of work its way into our life. So that's another pointer that I make is, is just, just be aware that the grief thing is very big, that we have all kinds of losses that may come to bear on us. And like you said, it's not just the losses of the past, but the losses of the future that we're talking about, the things that are not going to be there, taking those seriously uh, journaling about them, talking about them with someone who is safe, um, yep. is, is huge. Um, the other part of that, uh, another tip is just being aware of your expectations for the holidays. What are they? Because we've all got them. The, the problem is most of us don't take time to evaluate them and actually pull them up. They're just unspoken. And then we all know other people have expectations of us too. And the world has expectations of us and being able to look at those expectations and say, OK, as you said, Linda, I don't have my normal bandwidth. Just how realistic are these expectations and say and then begin to develop a plan? I think everyone needs a plan for the holidays, e even if it's a very simple one step plan but a plan. And, uh, you know, people say, well, what kind of plan? Well, and I say, well, whatever the plan is, it takes your grief seriously. It's loving toward yourself. It's loving toward the people around you. And sooner or later, it has some aspect of service to it. As you meant, as you mentioned, it has to do with doing something for someone else. And there's a whole variety of options for that. Um, we all have traditions over the holidays. Is there a tradition we want to continue and specifically honor our loved one with? Do we need to morph it somehow? Um, anyway, I could go on and share examples, but I don't exactly know uh, where you want to go with that. 
Well, they can they can also get your book, and we'll share at the end yes. of the show where they can get your book. But I've got a couple of thoughts on that. The first one is I love what you said about you know checking your expectations. Cut yourself some slack. Now, that is one of my tips. Cut yourself mm. some slack, and especially for those of you who the expectation is that you're going to cook the full meal deal on Christmas Day for Christmas oh, dinner. Boy. You know, mm. grief is distracting, and mm operating the electric knife to carve that turkey or ham dangerous. or prime yes. rib, it is dangerous and the ER is not a great place to dine. No. And so cut yourself some slack and buy some things that are store-bought. And I know, you know, some people, I, I was one of the blessed uh, children who grew up with that hot made from scratch meal every mm. Christmas. My mom's an excellent cook and with five of us kids and, you know, mom and dad and, you know, the setting was gorgeous and everything. That's what I grew up with. Well, I now, I cook the dinner for our family and our family is much larger now because of all the, um, you know, we've all been married and having children and grandchildren and such. So it's grown. And I remember in the first few years after losing Allie, you know, that distraction, I couldn't remember what two plus two was. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. really um, cut yourself some slack, buy some store-bought, you know, if the, if your family wants grandma's 40 year old roll recipe, then buy deli gravy, you know, just cut yourself some yes. slack. Some, and so to go back to your plan, I really love that idea. And I, I imagine that some people are saying, well, what kind of plan, what kind of plan do I have mm -hmm. to get through mm -hmm. Christmas? Mm -hmm. So here's something that you can do is make a plan for the next two weeks to watch a funny holiday movie every night. And that sounds silly, and it sounds also very simple, mm. but the importance of laughter, yes. one laugh can scatter 100 griefs. It's a respite for your brain. It mm. doesn't cure your grief, but it's a respite for your brain. And so watching a funny holiday movie every night is a great plan okay it also gives your body a break because you're resting in your recliner you're knitting or playing sudoku or whatever at the same time you're watching the movie right but most importantly you're taking a break from that grief pain mm. and that's a great plan we do need to be distracted from time to time if if distraction is a is an okay word um it's well, it's all yes Laughter is a respite. Yes. It, it's, you know, laughter really is good medicine. It is a powerful healing modality. And what I mean by that is that mm. you don't laugh one evening and then you feel all better. It doesn't cure your grief, right? But right. you've got to give yourself permission because your heart can hold joy the same time as sorrow. Yes. It really does. You don't have to choose. Mm. And it's important to allow that joy through laughter or whatever to deposit into your your memory bank in your heart because it balances the sadness yes and so you when you talked about creating a plan mm -hmm. you can do things in that plan that help distract you from that pain and just as you said distraction some people think that's oh that then they're ignoring their grief or they're running away from their grief or they're not processing their grief no, it's a respite for your brain, and that's good for you. So yes. I'm glad you brought that up about the distraction because that's a really hot topic. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yes, it is. And, um, you know, none of us can handle the full onslaught of our grief. I mean, it would do us in. So thank goodness that there are things that, that balance that out. And yeah. when you said, you know, when you said, you know, be realistic, be aware of your bandwidth. Uh, I kind of, I give the illustration that right now I'm 100% Gary. And let's say that, uh, but then I have a loss. And all of a sudden, let's say that grief is taking up 50% of Gary. It's probably taking up more than that. But let's say it's just taking up 50%. That leaves only 50% of Gary to do life. And to expect myself 
to continue to do things the way I did them before the loss when there's only 50% of me available, when in reality there's probably only 15% of me available, maybe 10%. Um, that really, yes, and if I have to say, okay, how much of me is available? And if I say 10%, that helps me be a little more realistic about the holidays and helps mm -hmm. me really proactively decide what do I really want to do? How do I want to do it? Who do I want to do it with, if anyone? And when do I want to do it? Instead of just going with the flow and winding up someplace where I don't want to be very exhausted at the end of it. And that's important because grief is exhausting already. Yes. And especially during the holidays, it's really hard for our loved ones to see us hurting. And mm -hmm. they have well-intentioned meaning behind their gestures, but likely they're going to try to book our calendar with things that bring us joy as a way to distract us. Yes. But the truth is grief is exhausting and it's okay to set down boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's okay not to accept every holiday party, every ballet, every school recital. It is okay to say, I can't do it all. Because people, they hate to see us in pain, so they want to, oh, you know, we'll invite them to the holiday party and this and that and the other. And, you know, you want to go because you don't want to disappoint them. But what happens when mm. you're already exhausted? Yes. Your emotional threshold goes down and those tears are closer to the surface because yes. our coping skills are below that threshold. Mm -hmm. Just think, think of a child who's exhausted. What do they do? They cry. They cry. Mm -hmm. And so same with adults. When we're exhausted, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, our threshold for coping goes down. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay not to accept every invitation. It, 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 again, it's giving yourself permission to skip the chaos. So, and I know, you know, even me, there's been times where I just want to go, 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 go. So mm. I don't have to think about the grief. Mm -hmm. But in the end, that does nothing to take care of me. No. And as we know, you know, when you ignore grief, silent grief is deadly grief. So Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. So. And, you know, you hit on that, that um, our tears are much more, much closer to the surface. Um, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things that, we end up talking about a lot or, or what we call grief bursts or grief spikes. And we all know what those are. We're walking along, we're minding our own business and the holidays are absolutely chocked full of grief triggers. Landmines. I mean, oh my goodness. Anything, anytime, anywhere can be a trigger. Yeah. And the grief suddenly gets triggered and it's on us. Well, one of the things we can do rather than feeling at the mercy of those things, is that when we accept a holiday invitation, like to a party, or we go somewhere where we think to ourselves, you know, there's a good likelihood that I might get triggered in this location, holiday shopping, a particular movie, a restaurant, whatever the case might be, then decide beforehand, okay, when I get triggered, just assume you will be, maybe you won't be, but when I get triggered, what are my options? What am I going to do? Am I going to take a deep breath and stay put? Am I going to take a deep breath and say, ah, would you just excuse me? As, as you know, I lost John this year and um, I just need just a moment. And you excuse yourself to the restroom or you excuse yourself to the car or whatever the case might be. Um, at least with my own self and with the people that I've talked with, having some kind of general plan for a grief burst when it happens really does take away some of the dread because it can be so unpredictable that it can really cause extra anxiety because we're way drop where we're waiting for it um, to happen. And that can be terrorizing. Well, and I really like it, the idea, again, you are a planner. <laughs> I love it because I'm, I'm not. I'm the opposite. But I love because when you have a plan, it's almost like you've got a safety net. Mm. And so it does. I don't want people to be fearful of accepting invitations. 
I want you to just pace yourself. That's yes. all. And so accepting the invitation, if you have that energy to do so, by all means, be proactive in yes. creating moments of joy for your heart and mm. just but have a plan. Just like you said, I love that. I think that's really, really wonderful because I think that a lot of people think, gosh, I'd really love to go to the ballet, but mm. what if I have a, a, a moment? And I call them Ellie moments after my daughter, Allie. Um, but you know, they're meltdowns, they are whatever you wanna call them. And, and if you have that, what do you do? So if you can figure it out ahead of time and create that plan in your mind, it's a reassurance that, okay, I'm likely to have a trigger and what am I gonna do if I do? So, yes. and I, I also wanna touch on you, you mentioned that, oh, you know, you can tell your companion, whoever you're with, that, you know, as you know, I lost John this year, but what if it's only, you know, not in, 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 the, in the near past, because I can honestly say that the yeah. joy did not return to my holidays for probably the first six years. Mm. And so sometimes when we say, well, as you know, I lost my daughter five, six years ago, a lot of people roll their eyes and they think, you're not over it yet. All you know, right. it opens up that conversation that really we don't want to go there. So what do you do with that? Is, it, you know, it. I guess, can we come up with a plan that doesn't always put us in that awkward position saying, well, you know what, five years really isn't a very long time. I just came out of the fog a couple of years ago. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we don't always want to educate in the moment. And right. so what, what can we do with something like that when it's been five, six, seven, ten 10 years, but we're triggered because triggers happen for the rest of our lives. How do we handle that? You know, that's a very good point because so many times we want to explain ourselves. We want mm -hmm. to explain, especially anything that is potentially making someone else feel uncomfortable or yep. I guess people choosing to feel uncomfortable with what we're expressing. Um, and I have to remind myself sometimes that, you know, is it really my responsibility to give an explanation? Mm. And of course the answer is no. Um, I want to be able to say something. And so uh, I'm, a big, I'm a big advocate of canned responses uh, so that <laughs> here we go with another plan, right? Um, I know, love I, it, I love I, it. You're I, teaching I, me tons. Oh my goodness. Um, a canned response of some kind that when you don't know what to say, that just pops out of your mouth. And, and it works. And it works. And yeah. I can't tell anybody what their canned response should be, um, but they can find one that just fits with them. Um, even if it's just, whew, I'm having a little moment right now. If you'll excuse me for a moment, maybe that's it. Or maybe it's um, when somebody, people often ask, you know, over the holidays, what do I do when those well-meaning people say things that are just really not helpful? Um, or when you do get the eye rolls, um, when they know that you're grieving a loss that is five or six years old. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. We grieve every day on mm -hmm. multiple levels all yeah. the time. And so, um, you know, if, if we just come up with a canned phrase, it can be as simple as, uh, yes, you're right. I'm not over it. And, uh, or yes, I'm still grieving or say nothing at all or whatever the case might be, but that, you know, you've come up with a canned phrase for those uncomfortable moments and you use it. And it really does help because otherwise you end up either backing out of the situation and getting more emotional, which is fine, or we don't know what to say. And then we blabber a bunch of stuff in front of someone that's really not trustworthy with our heart at that moment. Good and point. we end up, and we end up regretting that later. We feel like we've hurt ourselves on top of us just hurting. So the canned response is really valuable, I think. 
I love that because, you know, sometimes if we feel like we have to explain, we feel defensive yes. and not because they're making us feel defensive, but there is a, a, a very dominant feeling out there in our culture that you should be over it in six months, three yes. months, a year. And so I can honestly say it's been nine years since we lost our daughter and I grieve every single day. And yes, the holidays heighten my grief. But what I've learned just going back to my own coping techniques is to do things that create joy for myself and give to others because that does make me feel better. That does bring joy to my world. And so we are going to grieve the loss of our loved one for the rest of our lives. And people who've not experienced loss can't comprehend that. Mm. And there's no easy way to educate them on that. Grief is one of those things that can't be taught. Yes. It has to be experienced to understand the complexities of it. And so if you find yourself not in a position where you really have the the energy to educate someone, um, you know, you can just say, I'm still processing my loss. It's been seven mm -hmm. years and the holidays highlight, um, you know, my, my loss. And so I'm just processing. You can also just say, I'm not feeling well. And yes. they're going to assume you're not feeling physically well. But truth be told, in that moment, because you're triggered, you're not feeling emotionally well because grief that's what grief is right and yes. so that's okay to just say i'm not feeling well and let them think that you're feeling not feeling physically well okay it's it's just really about honoring your own pain and doing what you need to do in that moment to get through that wave of pain and in mm. some cases your only job is to just breathe mm. yeah and yeah. that's really important, the breathing. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So what other tips do you have? I'm well, loving this, by the way. I love that you've got a plan for everything. You're teaching me tons. I love it. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my oh my goodness. Um and and by the and by the way, with your plan, uh be flexible. You know, if you're a if you know, if if you're a fan of the Incredibles the way I am, I I really like a line from Elastigirl, you know, whatever the crisis, <laughs> I'm flexible. So wh now you're speaking my language. <laughs> yeah, wh whatever the situation, you know, we have a plan and that plan brings the safety net. But we do, you know, we do remain flexible with it because things just don't. I, I have yet to have a single day work out exactly like I plan. That's that's <laughs> that's for sure. Um, uh, the other thing uh, with regard to the holidays, I think in, in the midst of your plan is um, making sure that you do something specifically to honor your loved one, who, whoever it is that's foremost on your mind. Mm -hmm. And that could be serving at a soup kitchen. That could be uh, donating in somebody's name. That could be serving at a hospital or a hospice, or it could be giving away presents. It could be participating in Angel Tree, Salvation Army, or any of the wonderful things. The nice thing about the holidays is we have no end of things that we can participate in. Um, or we can just think about somebody else who might be hurting from grief over the holidays and just making a call or a contact to just say you know what i can relate and i'm thinking about you not i know how you feel because nobody knows how you know how you feel but being able to say I i'm just thinking about you and you're right linda we really heal a little bit each time we grieve now, yeah. it doesn't necessarily feel that way at the time, you know, in the same way that I can't tell you what I ate for lunch four weeks ago today, but I'm mm -hmm. here partially as a result of that lunch and all the other meals that I eat along the way. You know, in the same way, those little bitty acts of service, those little smiles and acts of kindness, um, they really are, as you said, medicine to our heart. And they mm -hmm. make a huge 
massive difference in our grief process. They give us perspective. So often grief is, it causes us, uh, well, when we get hit, we tend to internalize. We tend to back away, we tend to withdraw. Anytime mm-hmm. we're severely wounded, um, we do tend to withdraw. Isolate. We, did, we do, we tend to isolate. And as much as alone time is important and there is a place for that, to watch out for that isolation business and to deliberately reach out as best we can. Now, some of the people that I talk to are so tired of reaching out because it seems like everybody that they reach out to seems to slap them in some shape, form or fashion emotionally. And I just think that's really sad. And this is this is why other grievers are so important because other grievers on some level get it. They get our yeah. pain. We get it. We get each other's pain. And being able to support one another somehow through the holidays can be huge. That that is huge, and I'm glad that you brought that up because one of um, I think one of the tips that are, is very powerful is seeking out support with people mm-hmm. who speak your lost language. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is that if you've lost a child, find support from other bereaved parents. If you've lost a parent if you've lost a sibling, if you've lost a loved one to suicide, if you've lost a loved one to homicide or through a drunk driver or cancer, surrounding yourself with people who speak your lost language is very comforting. Mm. It helps you to know you're not the only one facing that kind of loss. And it also together, it unites you all and when you're around people who speak your lost language, you don't have to explain mm. anything. Nothing. They get you. They're your yes. people. Yes. And so a lot of people say, well, there's no support group in my town. Mm. Well, that may be true, but that's not the only source of support. There are online groups. There are a myriad of ways to you know, surround yourself with people who speak your lost language. Mm. Mm. And so... You know, any one of, um, you know, doing a a search on Google will come up with different support groups that are virtual, that are in person, that are through Facebook closed groups or secret groups, what have you. They're out there. And it's really important to surround yourself with support any time of year. I remember when we first lost Mm -hmm. Allie, you know, I did not want to go to a support group. I remember thinking that. I could could not even deal with my own pain. The pain was mm. it it, it mm. crushed me. It stole my breath. I wasn't even sure I would survive. And the mm. idea of going to a support group where other people had the same kind of crushing loss was just beyond my coping skills. Well, long story short, <laughs> the mm. first time I actually went to a support group was I was speaking to it. Huh. And that is when I understood the value Mm. of Mm. a support group. And Mm. so whatever way you find others who speak your lost language, find them. They're out there. Surround yourself with them. That's important because they get you. Yes. And you can't underestimate the power of being around others who are just like you. Together, you can find your way. And that's healing that's empowering, that's proactive. There's nothing bad about that whatsoever. So take my advice and don't wait years. Uh-huh. <laughs> but or we even read a book, read one of Gary's books, you know, read, <laughs> read diaries to surround uh-huh. yourself again um, in whatever form it comes by people who are seasoned in their grief, they're seasoned veterans. They've been there, they know what it's like and they are the the face of hope that it's survivable. Mm. Yes. So, yeah, that's you know, really important. I thank you. That's probably um, I, I really believe people make all the difference in our grief process one yeah. one way or the other. And the real key is getting around people who are helpful to us and somehow, especially at the holidays, kind of protecting our hearts and limiting our exposure to those who really aren't helpful to us. Because if I'm operating on 15% of me, 
I really need people around me that pour into me, if at all possible, if at all possible. Yeah, Yeah, well said. You ever heard brain bucks or the spoon theory? Yes, but go for it. You you can go. (laughs) Well, for viewers who aren't familiar with it, spoon theory or brain bucks is a way of describing, let's say you wake up Saturday morning and you only have 10 brain bucks to deal with for the entire day. And so you think, okay, I've got a shower. I have to eat. Oh, I also have to go do recycling. Mm -hmm. How many brain bucks are each of these things going to cost? So basically it's a way of, you know, scheduling your day around the bandwidth that you have to work with on that given day. Keep in mind, every day is different. Some days we have a little more energy than other days. Some days we have none at all. And those days it's okay to do nothing. It really is. Um, But brain bucks or the spoon theory is a way of managing your resources, your inner resources for coping in that day. So Gary, you talk about it being like 15% of Gary. And I love that analogy because um, that's very clear and and, and simple and understanding. And those of us who've lost someone we love, we know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Linda's only operating on, you know, 10% today. And we don't have to tell everyone that, but we know inside. And then we know what we have to work with and we have to honor that. It's important. Yes, it is. So take care of yourself first. That should be the number one tip. Take care of yourself that, first. That well, uh, actually, that is the number one tip because you know we we can never give away what we don't have. And uh, I I had a hospice patient once who told me on my way out the door, he said, "Gary, take good care of yourself because you're no good to me if you don't." And that's really true. It is so true. Yep. We have to take care of ourselves first before it's kind of like the, you know, this is, I know you've heard this before. Well, every time you travel, you hear it, but it's like putting that oxygen mask on you first before helping the people around you. You know, if you don't put that oxygen mask on you, you're going to go unconscious and you can't help anybody. (laughs) So it's very true. So what's your one final tip? I guess this one phrase runs through my mind about the holidays. It's, it's my little mantra and take it for what it's worth. These holidays will be different. They're going to be different, Mm. but they can still be good. They're going to be different, but they can still be good. So make a plan, make a plan, make a simple plan. (laughs) Make a plan, make Gary's plan. I love it. Okay, and so my final tip is to treat your senses to what I call the rule of five. And what that is, your, your emotions are raw, right? And that takes time to process your loss. But treating your five tactile senses, I'm holding up 10 fingers, <laughs> five tactile <laughs> senses, <laughs> it is a, a simple reminder that not all pleasure is lost, okay? Mm-hmm. And so every day, and I'm going to read this or I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to get it all confused here. Every day I want you to acknowledge five things that you see, four things that you feel. OK, when I say feel uh, tactile senses, uh, a silky scarf, warm socks, a fuzzy blanket. Those are things that you feel Four things you can feel that bring pleasure. Three things that you can hear that bring pleasure, such as the sound of children laughing. Christmas music, um, a funny YouTube video. Okay, three things you can hear, two things you can smell. I can think of a bazillion smells that bring me pleasure. Cookies, chocolate, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a a, a wonderful latte from Starbucks, eggnog latte. I mean, you know, there's so many smells that really lift our spirits. And one thing you can taste. So again, it's five things you can see, like the sun setting, or cloud formations, or a pretty flower in bloom if you're in the tropics, four things you can feel, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. For me, it's chocolate Mm. or pizza. (laughs) What about you? What would be, if you could pick one thing to taste that would bring you pleasure, what would it be, Gary? Oh, dark chocolate. chocolate. A man after my own heart, chocolate (laughs) all the way around. (laughs) 
So, all righty. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, you you provide a wealth of information, and I'm really really grateful. And so, where can people first off, where can they find your book? Um, the simplest thing, well, it can be found on uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, just about any online retailer. The simplest way is to probably go to my website at GaryRoe.com, G-A-R-Y-R-O-E.com, and click on the book tab. And uh, you can, all of my books, you can download a free excerpt. To, you can kind of get a feel for them to see, you know, do I resonate with this or not? Uh, because yeah. the last the last thing you need is to go out and get something else that's not going to resonate with your heart. Yeah. You need something yeah. that really communicates to you. So um, I would recommend going, downloading a free excerpt and seeing, seeing what you think. And then if it looks helpful to you, there's a bunch of buttons that you can click to either take you to Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and you can go from there. Wonderful. Thank you. And if viewers want to contact you or have any questions, how do they reach you? Same way, uh, GaryRow.com. If you'll scroll down to the bottom of each page, there's a contact Gary box and you can just write me an email and uh, people say, do you personally read these? Absolutely. I read and respond to every email I get. Um, it is a busy season, so just be patient with me. It might take me a couple of days to respond to an email, but I will, I will get back to you. And I, I, I would love your questions and, and what you think. I would really appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight, Gary. I really appreciate it. You are a wonderful, wonderful soul and a beautiful beacon of light and hope for people out in the world. So thank you for doing everything that you do. And viewers, um, thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you that are struggling, look Gary and I up. Um, you know, you can find us everywhere. Uh, my website's lindafell.com, griefdiaries.com. And if you really have uh, a little bit of extra energy and you want to adopt our family's tradition of the 12 nights of kindness as your own, that information is on griefdiaries.com or lindafell.com. And it starts Thursday night and it ends on Christmas Eve. So mm -hmm. if we don't see you until after the holidays, wishing you all a warm and wonderful holiday season. I know that Hanukkah, the um, eighth night was last night for those of you celebrating Hanukkah and for those of you who celebrate Christmas, a very Merry Christmas. And we hope to see you soon. So thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. I don't know if we're still filming us trying to end and it won't end. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. Well, don't, don't you love it when I'm clear? It doesn't want to end, but when I I'm, when 